。是的。那么接下来呢，我们在这一个阶段邀请到的第二位讲师是台湾北陆能源发展股份有限公司马胜安开发执行董事。So, ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Taiwan Northland Power Development Managing Director Development Taiwan, Mr. Sean McDermott. Let's welcome. 掌声的欢迎好吗？谢谢大家参加今天，谢谢 GSHA 为这个机会来说话。我将说到各自经历的经验、农田的经验、建造海洋风能和投资在太阳能电池上，以及个人经验的一些点，关于投资海洋能电池在台湾的现状、政策和挑战，以及挑战。相对的，如果有问题，大家有什么疑问，关于我们今天所讨论的话题，我很乐意回复。之后，请你们尽快找到我，我期待能够见到任何人有疑问，关于现在发生在产业和现在发生在我们公司。So very quickly, uh, Northland, who are we? We're a Canadian independent power producer. Uh, we have about 30 years of history. We uh, started working um, in the cogeneration space uh, with uh, originally producing energy through the use of um, wood products from the lumber industry. And about 15 years ago, we transitioned into renewable energy. And Canada was investing into uh, renewable energy um, and setting up programs in support of that. So we moved first into onshore wind, then into solar. Um, and from that experience, we began, we developed an expertise in renewable energy project finance, which we then used to transition into offshore wind. So as of today, um, we are the world's fourth largest owner operator of, of offshore wind um, with projects uh, across uh, operational projects in Northern Europe um, in offshore wind, as well as onshore wind um, and solar projects in other parts of Europe and in North America. Um, more Recently, we've been investing in Asia. We have the 1,000 megawatts or 2,000 megawatts of projects in development in Taiwan, uh, and we're also uh, building and constructing projects um, uh, in in Japan and in Korea. So we see Asia as a big part of the uh, uh, company's development because. Um, much as uh, in the rest of the world, Asian countries are trying to transition away from um, uh, carbon intensive technologies uh, into renewable energies. So we're hoping to be part of, of that process. In Taiwan, we have um, uh, a 1,000 megawatts, 1,044 megawatts of projects in offshore, in, in um, the round two allocation. Um, process. Um, we call that the Hailong Project, Hailong 2 and Hailong 3. We were awarded 300 megawatts um, in 2018 through uh, the allocation process. That 300 megawatts comes with a feed-in tariff regime um, and uh, a feed-in tariff price um, supported by Thai Power and the BOE. And uh, later in that same year, we were awarded an additional 744 megawatts through a competitive uh, auction process. In addition to Hailong, in addition to the 1,044 megawatts that we're developing in Hailong, we, uh, along with other uh, offshore wind developers, are competing or planning to compete in the upcoming round three auction. Um, as, as Bart was discussing, Taiwan um, is investing heavily in renewable energy going forward, but it's hard to find. And um, the, the projects that are being um, that have been developed in onshore and offshore, we are largely uh, committed to selling that to Thai Power. The expectation for around the round three offshore wind auction, however, is that while there will be um, a bid price to go in, um, and the lowest bid will have the right to build, um, there's an opportunity um, to. Um, step out of the, those contracts and, and find corporate off-takers. So for those of you who are, are looking for large-scale access to um, renewable energy, um, there's about a dozen companies, including ourselves, who are preparing to uh, bid into um, Taiwan's round three auction, offshore wind auction process. And 
most of us are, are going to be relying uh, on corporate power purchase agreements to uh, be the primary source of, of, of revenue over the course of the 2025 years. Taiwan is uh, planning on uh, 15 gigawatts uh, of offshore wind through the round three process. It's 1.5 gigawatts a year for, um, for 10 years. Uh, to put that into context, as of today, and, and Bart can correct me if I'm wrong, but my impression is that the Taiwan's uh, grid is somewhere in the range of 45 to 50 gigawatts, um, most of which is baseload power. Um, and so it's different with renewable energy. It's not a compare, you can't replace one gigawatt of coal or nuclear or gas with one gigawatt of renewables. Um, nonetheless, the scale of the uh, around three offshore wind target of 15 gigawatts represents almost 30% of, of the current uh, capacity. Although again, there's a difference between gigawatts and gigawatt hours. Um, nonetheless, the, the opportunity uh, that Northland sees and that other developers see for, for Taiwan is significant. Um, and we're continuing to be um, uh, active in that process. Um, so uh, our High Long project, um, not to overstate it, but it will be uh, the second largest offshore wind project in Taiwan once it's finished. Um, or I should say we'll have the second amount of capacity, second largest amount of capacity awarded to, um, uh, to a single developer. Um, or says number one, we're number two. Um, other developers in the space are WPD and CIP and China Steel and Thai Power. Um, but we have been investing, <laughs> we've invested, we have a team of about 90 people now in Taiwan. Um, we're supporting our, what are our current operations with uh, additional staff in uh, other parts of the world, Canada, Europe, uh, Japan, Korea. Um, but we have 90 people in Taiwan now. The other developers all also have hundreds of people. So um, I first personally came to Taiwan um, in 2016. At the time, there was a few dozen of us working in the industry. Now there's there's hundreds. Um, and um, the investment that that uh, the, the government and Thai Power have made into promoting offshore wind in particular is uh, showing up in uh, significant uh, uh, growth of an industry and in hiring of people, and that's uh, that's very uh, successful in that respect. Um, I'm not. I'm one other item I'll talk about before I get to this, but but just to to build on one of the topics that Bart was talking about. I don't have a slide for it, but I'll just uh, discuss it. Um, the uh, as part of this entire effort for Taiwan to meet uh, a net zero by 2050, there is a big push on growing. Uh, the renewable energy generation industry. And everyone in this room, or mo many of you in the room, need to source it. Where is it coming from? <laughs> because as, as, as Bart described and I mentioned, at the moment, all of the electricity is uh, being sold to uh, Thai Power as part of the feed-in tariff contracts. Um, one option, as Bart described, is, is um, generating electricity yourself, and, and onshore turbines is one option, solar is another. Offshore wind is not an option, you don't, you can't, <laughs> unless you have a factory uh, 50 kilometers offshore, uh, you won't be using um, an offshore wind turbine. Um, but the, there is a big push to, for Taiwan to go green, to move off of gas and coal and nuclear. Um, and, and renewable energy will be, part, will be a big part of the solution. But where do you get it from? And, and the answer will, uh, part of the answer um, is, uh, it will be the round three offshore wind auctions. Now, we're still <laughs> watching to see exactly how that manifests um, in terms of who wins what, when, um, what are the ongoing rules that come out to um, determine the, uh, the nature of the ongoing investment. Um, anyone who's followed offshore wind uh, in Taiwan knows that there, the, the, there's five projects in construction right now. Ours is not included in those. Two of them are behind schedule. Um, they're behind schedule for many reasons. A lot of it tied to COVID. Um, but, but a big part of it, and that's what I discuss here, is that the, the, the rules are hard. Um, there's restrictions. Um, uh, on permitting, there's restrictions on um, getting access to vessel, staff, equipment. Um, there's, there's a lot of um, 
challenges around actually bringing in people, bringing in technology um, that allow us to build quickly and on time and on budget. And what the probably the, the the fundamental challenge that we face as an industry is that we're being pushed to be cheap, be fast, and be local. And you can't do all three. You can really, you can guarantee one. Um, you can maybe get two. It's very hard to get three. Um, and the, the expectation, not just the expectation, the rules <laughs> um, the, 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 around the round two auctions and the round three auctions is fast, cheap, and local. Um, so we're, 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 it's a, uh, it's a constant tension uh, around what we know we can deliver, um, what we want to deliver, what we're being expected to deliver. Um, and um, it's, it's an ongoing challenge. So um, what will be important though um, uh, is, is, is to ensure that there is sufficient supply, not just for yourselves as corporate off-takers, but, but actually Taiwan, as we all know, Taiwan is experiencing significant energy disruptions. That's happening now uh, while the nuclear is still online. Uh, the nuclear is supposed to come off in a few years and there's global um, uh, energy supply challenges everywhere around uh, the inflation that's that's um, making its way through the system. Uh, on top of that, um, um, or as, as, as a consequence of that, it's very important that um, the renewable energy industry has the support of industry, of government, to, to not just um, build profitably, but build on time. And um, we're, very, we're all very conscious of that. Um, and we engage with customers, we engage with the government regularly on schedule. Um, because it's 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 important not just to be local, but to be to be on time. Uh, Taiwan needs the energy. The interesting thing about Taiwan um, is that uh, I mean, there's many interesting things about Taiwan. But from an energy supply perspective, one of the things that's unique about Taiwan, uh, all over the world, um, countries are transitioning from carbon to. Um, carbon electrons to carbon-free electrons from from coal and gas to to green, and that creates a big um, so that, uh, that's a that's a big part of the supply demand equation. What's also sorry that's a big part of the supply equation. Most most green energy investment uh, in the world is fuel switching, going from coal and gas to green. Taiwan has that commitment plus, and this is unique, a increase in actual demand. Um, the, a lot of Europe and North America are not seeing growth in industrial manufacturing. Taiwan is. Uh, the semiconductor industry is booming. It's been one of the biggest beneficiaries of uh, the work from home phenomenon um, uh, that, that uh, was created by COVID. It's going to only get stronger as we continue to transition into more electrical vehicles, as there's more uh, big tech. Um, as you see, as we move into um, the metaverse and Web 3.0, where there's higher and higher degrees of, of people working, not just online, but working um, with, with, with um, augmented reality and virtual reality, all of that needs semiconductors uh, and, and fabs. And, and the, the, the production of semiconductors um, and fabs is very, very energy intensive. So I think it's, it's fairly public that TSMC is it requires an enormous amount of, of new energy um, as, as they construct their facilities. But it's not just TSMC, it's, it's the entire industry. Um, coupled with the consequence of, of, uh, of t uh, the, the um, trade tariffs that were introduced um, first under the Trump administration, but continued under the Biden administration, there's been a huge amount of reshoring of Taiwanese industry from China into Taiwan. So Taiwan is experiencing not just the supply um, change that the whole world is experiencing, but a big increase in demand. So um, all of that means that the, the, the need for the renewable energy industry to deliver is very high. As part of that, though, we have some challenges, and I'll just touch on these very quickly. The first one, localization, I touched on a little bit. Um, and this is the, the, the round two and the round three um, auction rules have very high uh, uh, 
uh, requirements that for, for supplying um, or procuring, I should say, equipment from, from Taiwanese uh, manufacturers. That's, that's, that's good in principle. In practice, uh, it's a new industry. And because it's a new industry in Taiwan, there's not expertise and it's, it's expensive. It's more expensive to buy some of that material from Taiwan than it would be to procure it from other parts of Asia or the rest of the world. Uh, it's also, it's, it, it's, it, equipment is one piece, another piece is logistics and, and operations and management. And particularly, and this is silly, but particularly boats. Boats is, is one of our biggest challenges. You need a certain kind of boat to install an offshore wind vehicle. Um, our offshore wind turbine. Bart's uh, presentation included videos showing these enormous cranes that lift huge pieces of metal off the ground. Well, imagine doing that in the ocean with waves. Uh, you need a, a, a and, and actually a, a taller turbine, a taller and a heavier turbine. So there's only a certain number of boats in the world that you can use uh, and access to to get to these um, to build these facilities, and. Um, um, Taiwan is asking to, um, is making it hard to get the boats into the country for various reasons. So boats is a problem, equipment is a problem, and as, as Bart also described, permitting is a challenge. COVID restrictions, well, that's a whole other topic. <laughs> I won't get into that. But I will say that the two projects, the two offshore wind projects that are behind now, a big reason for that was COVID, uh, and part of it had to do with with their own with manufacturing facilities uh, being offline in other countries. Nothing they can do there, but part of it was also just the difficulty of bringing staff in and bringing people on and off boats, and that was um, had to do with uh, sort of the, the the COVID restrictions around visas and um, and and moving people in and out of quarantine. Uh, well, there was one example of a crew change on a boat. They actually went to Hong Kong to change the crew because the crew couldn't, they couldn't get permission to change crews uh, in Taiwan. Um, and that was just, I mean, that, we, we all have to be conscious of COVID. It's important. But uh, at the same time, that was an unnecessary bureaucratic hassle. Um, that has that was that, that that has added to the challenges. Um, my final point: structural efficiencies. I won't go into it in any more detail than what I said. Suffice it to say, this is a new market. Uh, we need to um, uh, we we need to be able to deliver price, localization, schedule are what we're being asked of us. We can do one. We can maybe do two. It's very hard to do three. So um, we have to work with partners and with government to make that understood. So that's it for me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. McDermott, for the sharing.